Hi guys, welcome back to a case of Econ Struggles. Today I'm going to be going over a unit review for Unit 4 of AP Macroeconomics. This is going to be in the financial sector. Timestamps are below if you would like to jump around, but let's go ahead and get right into it. And just as a reminder, I am going to be covering all of Unit 4, just sort of the overview, give you the big idea for each one of these topics. And again, the timestamps below will tell you each specific section. And so unsurprisingly, I'm going to start with section 4.1, which is about financial assets. This is basically what this whole unit is about. It's something that I think students struggle with in general, just because assets are sort of the most vague and ambiguous term, especially if you're not really used to thinking about assets or thinking about money, it can be sort of challenging. But let's just first start out by thinking what exactly is an asset. All an asset is, is something that has value, something that stores value. So for example, the dollar bill that you might have in your wallet, that's an asset, that's money, or demand deposits, the amount of money you have in your bank. You could also have different types of assets. Most commonly, you could think of stock, like the stock market, or you can think about bonds. All a bond is, is really like an IOU, which means that it's gonna pay interest. You're basically loaning someone some money. They're gonna repay you that money plus interest, which means that when you have an IOU, the price that they're gonna pay you to hold the money is both based on the time value of money and basically how risky that bond is. So if you buy a bond from a company, if that company doesn't do well, if they go bankrupt, if they fold, you're not gonna get your money back, and so that's a high risk. And so if there's a higher risk of them defaulting on that debt, they're gonna to have to pay you more in order for you to wanna to buy that bond. And so what we're gonna say is that lower price bonds are gonna have a higher interest rate than higher price bond. And if you wanna calculate your rate of return, you just think about your earnings and compare that to your costs. One thing that goes along with this is sort of real versus nominal interest rates. If we're gonna talk about an interest rate, we need to be specific about what type of interest rate we're talking about. Like I've talked about in previous videos, real basically nets out inflation, nominal includes inflation. So if we apply that to rate of returns or to interest rates, suppose that I loan a company $100 in a bond and it's gonna pay 10% interest over that year then my nominal interest rate, or little i, is gonna be 10%. On the other hand, if prices rise by 5% during that year, then inflation is 5%, then it's as if the amount of money that I actually got out of that interest is only 5%. Because even though I got 10% in a nominal interest rate, inflation wiped out 5%, and so my real interest rate is little i minus pi or inflation, that gives me 5%. So all you need to know is that the real interest rate is the nominal interest rate minus inflation. Now, of course, it's easy to look back and say, okay, well, what inflation was, I can just take my nominal interest rate, subtract off inflation, and then I'll get my real interest rate. But what about if I'm setting the nominal interest rate today for a year from now, how do I know what inflation is if inflation hasn't happened yet? Well, what we're gonna do is we're basically gonna make some sort of guess about what we think inflation is gonna be or expected level of inflation Sometimes that's E of pi, sometimes that's pi E, and then we're gonna target a real interest rate based on a nominal interest rate and an expected inflation. We're gonna get RE, and so then the nominal interest rate that we set is just gonna be our expected real interest rate plus our expected inflation. So again, this is just because we're looking forward. We don't know exactly what inflation is gonna be. We're just guessing as what we think inflation is gonna be. And now that we sort of have those tools under our belt, let's start talking about money specifically in the banking system so that eventually we can talk about monetary policy and how monetary policy affects GDP and other economic outcomes. So money is a unit of account. We can use it to add up the values of different things. So for example, if I'm thinking about coffee and coffee mugs, well, I can't really add four coffees and four coffee mugs together to figure out what GDP is. But what I could do is I could think about, well, the coffee costs $4 and the coffee mugs cost $10, turn them all into money, and then I could add them up. That would tell me the value of those coffee and those coffee mugs together. That's easier to figure out to add together in order to figure out GDP. Money is also a medium of exchange. I can go into a store and I can give someone some money and they'll give me the goods or the groceries. So money doesn't necessarily have to be cash. It's really anything that people are willing to accept in order for other goods. And of course, money is a way of storing value. Now, there are sort of different types of money according to the US government based on how we categorize different assets. For the AP macro class, the ones you really wanna know are M0, which is the monetary base, which is just the amount of bills, the number of dollar bills in circulation, as well as the number of bills in bank reserves. 
If we want to add checking accounts to that, then that becomes M1. And if we want to add savings accounts and these things called traveler's checks, which no one really uses anymore, then we get to M2. Those are basically the three types of the three classifications of money that you're going to need to know for the AP macro exam. And now before we talk about monetary policy, we're going to have to talk a little bit about how the banking system works. And so what we're going to talk about is when you or Bill goes to the bank and puts a dollar into their checking account, we want to talk about exactly what the bank does with that dollar. So that's what we're going to talk about. And the way this is going to work is when you put a dollar into the bank, the bank is going to use that dollar and they're going to have something called a T account or a balance sheet. And they are going to basically record your dollar deposit as a liability. A liability just means something you owe someone else. Because if you are loaning that dollar to the bank, then at any time you could come to the bank and ask for your dollar back. And so that dollar is a liability. On the other hand, you're going to get some assets out of that dollar because your assets are always equal to your liabilities. So what's going to happen is the bank is going to take that dollar and the Federal Reserve or the central bank is going to say, of that dollar, there's a certain amount that you need to keep on hand in your vault, and it's gonna be a percentage of those deposits. So suppose, for example, the Fed sets that reserve ratio or that reserve ratio requirement at 25%. For every dollar that you put into the bank, they're gonna set aside 25 cents and they're gonna hold that in the vault. Now, it could be the case that the bank wants to hold more than that 25% of that dollar. Maybe they wanna hold an additional 25% not because they're legally required to, just because that's sort of what they want to do. That's what they feel is maximizing their profit. And so that's what we call excess reserves. On the asset side, we have mandatory reserves. We have excess reserves. And this 50% remaining, that's what the bank can use to loan out to other people who come to the bank and ask for a loan. And so those 50 cents are going to be the loanable funds. And all three of these are going to end up being exactly equal to that dollar that Bill put into the bank. The reason this is so useful is because this required reserve ratio is going to tell us what's called the money multiplier, which is just 1 over RR, which means that, for example, in our example, if the required reserve ratio is 25%, then the money multiplier would be 4. Let's think about why that is. So Bill comes in, he puts a dollar in the bank, and then what that bank does is let's say that they don't have any excess reserves at all. They're going to hold it aside 25 cents. And they're going to loan out 75 cents to someone else. Maybe it's Dana. Dana's going to put that 75 cents into her bank. And the bank is going to take a fourth of that and put it in their reserves. They're going to take three fourths of that, or 75%, and they're going to loan it out to someone else. Maybe Eva. And Eva's going to put that into her bank, and the cycle is just going to keep going. And if we add, and if we add up all these amounts that are getting deposited into banks, we would get $4, or the money multiplier. And so the money multiplier is useful because if the central bank wants to increase the money supply, well, they don't necessarily have to increase the money supply by the total amount that they want. They can use this money multiplier and basically figure out how many extra bills they need to inject into the system in order to get their desired increase in terms of money. And now we get to our first graph of this unit, which is the money market graph. Basically, the goal of this money market graph is to find the nominal interest rate that balances or gets us to equilibrium between the supply and the demand for money. So in order to understand how this graph works, let's think about what happens as the interest rate goes up. Well, as the interest rate goes up, as the nominal interest rate goes up, then it's going to be more attractive for people to want to hold their money in banks because banks are paying that nominal interest rate to people for holding money in their bank. And so what's going to happen is people are going to want to save and deposit money into the bank more and so the demand for money is going to go down because people don't want cash in their pockets. They want their cash in the bank. On the other hand, the money supply, the total number of bills in circulation, is set by the Federal Reserve or the central bank, which means that the number of bills in circulation is not related to the interest rate at all. So it's just going to be a vertical line at the quantity of money. And so the money market graph is going to look like this, where we've got money demand, whereas the interest rate falls more people are going to want to have money in their pocket rather than in the bank. And so the quantity of money demanded is going to be higher. And like we said, the amount of money in circulation is set by the Federal Reserve. It's not related to the interest rate at all. And so it's a vertical line. Where these two curves intersect, that's where supply and demand are equal. And that tells us the equilibrium or the rate of interest that we want to set in order to balance supply and demand in the money market. Now I just talked a little bit about the central reserve setting the amount of money. And so this brings us to monetary policy, 
which is going to be sort of an intro about how monetary policy works. Now, the two levers that the central bank has are one, they can change how much of that dollar the bank needs to keep in the vault. They can change the reserve requirement ratio or the RR. They can also change the supply of money or the number of bills in circulation through what's called open market operations. The way that works is what the Federal Reserve can do is they can buy assets from the private sector. They can buy treasury bills, for example. And what they're going to do when they buy those assets is they're going to inject cash into the system because they're going to trade cash for those securities. And so the monetary supply or the supply of money is going to increase. On the other hand, they can sell those assets back to the public. The public is going to give them cash. They can take that cash and, I don't know, stash it in a closet somewhere, maybe burn it, just basically take that money out of circulation, which means that the supply of money is going to go down. The last piece before we get into this aggregate demand, aggregate supply model is we have a loanable funds graph or a graph for the loanable funds market. And our goal here is basically to find a real interest rate because if we're thinking about loanable funds, we don't really care about inflation. So we could do I or R, but we're going to use R at the real interest rate such that the supply and demand of loanable funds is equal. Remember that loanable funds if we think back to that banking system example, loanable funds is basically the portion of that dollar that Bill deposited that the bank can loan back out to other people. And so for example, if the required reserve ratio is seven is 25%, then there's 75% available for loanable funds. And so if we think again about supply and demand and how that changes with regard to the real interest rate, if the real interest rate goes up, then just like when the nominal interest rate goes up, people are going to want to put their money into banks. They want to earn that higher interest rate from saving their money from keeping it in a bank, which means that there's going to be more money that the bank has to loan out to other people. So the supply of loanable funds will go up. On the demand side, as the real interest rate increases, this is not only the interest rate the bank is paying people to keep money in the bank, it's also the interest rate that people who get a loan have to pay back to the bank in interest. So as this real interest rate increases, loaning money becomes more expensive, which means the demand for those loanable funds is going to go down. And so what we have is we're going to have an upward sloping supply curve and a downward sloping demand curve. And that's exactly what we see in the graph for the loanable funds market, where here's the quantity of loanable funds, here's the real interest rate, Here's an upward sloping supply curve. Here's a downward sloping demand curve. We can find where they intersect, and that tells us the quantity and the real interest rate in terms of loanable funds that prevails in this market at equilibrium. And so now all we're going to do is we're going to put these three graphs together. We're going to review the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, and talk about how monetary policy influences these three graphs. And I'll just do one example. Maybe I'll just do the example in which we're in a recessionary gap because the longer an aggregate supply curve or our Y bar or a natural rate of output is to the right of where the short run aggregate supply curve and the short run aggregate demand curve are intersecting at the moment. So we're in a recessionary gap and we're asking how can the Fed use monetary policy in order to close this gap? What they're gonna do, they're gonna use expansionary monetary policy, maybe suppose that they increase the money supply. And so if they increase the money supply, if we go to our money market graph, the money supply curve is going to shift to the right because the Fed is increasing the money supply. And so our interest rate is going to fall from this point right here down to this point right here. That also means that if the money supply is increasing and our interest rate is falling, then in our loanable funds market, we're going to have fewer people who now want to keep their money in the bank. And so the supply of loanable funds decreases. And so now our real interest rate also goes down here. We have a higher demand for loanable funds and we have a higher supply of loanable funds because of course the Fed also increased the money supply. So that's just a real quick example of how monetary policy can work with ADAS and the loanable funds market and the money market. So again, just a quick overview of unit four of AP Macro. If there's a topic in particular you would like me to take a deeper dive into that you're still confused about, feel free to put that in the comment section below. But if this video or these videos in general helping you out, please like and subscribe. See you next time for another case of Econ Struggles.